feel like I started every goddamn time. No, I did the last one, remember? And not just the Close Encounters of the Third Kind reboot? That was me. Uh, I thought that was me. <laughs> sure that was me? <laughs> that was a really clever idea. That must have been me. <laughs> well, it was your idea. I just made it good. <laughs> okay. As you know, this is the measure of an episode. Where does our continuing mission to watch strange new episodes of Strange New Worlds? What? I'm Paul. I'm apparently on a different podcast. Are we and- going to do... Wait, oh, stop. <laughs> stop. I always feel like this is... I know this is still part of the main show, but right. I always feel like it's not part of the main show. <laughs> I don't know why you feel that way, because you just said, I know that this is part of the main show. <laughs> All right, I'll start over. As you know, this is the measure of an episode where it is our continuing mission to explore what makes Star Trek genuine Star Trek and not just great science fiction television of the highest caliber <laughs> the highest caliber of the only caliber there is not a show like this on television N- no and that includes this one because this is not on television um you know what i mean jonathan <laughs> <laughs> yes i do paul all right introductions aside and we do this with three criteria and this needs to be established for those of you just listening in this is not New Star Trek is not proper Star Trek, and bad and old Star Trek is proper Star Trek, and it's not the other way around either. We do this with three objective criteria. The first one is, is there sci-fi woven into the script? You cannot take the sci-fi out without drastically modifying the script. The sci-fi that's presented, criteria number two, is it presented in a unique and novel way, as in it is not just some standard stereotypes that you know what's going to happen long before it actually does? And criteria number three, is there some me- m- mythical? Is there some oral or, oh gosh, is there some <laughs> moral or ethical dilemma that a character has to face? I'm Jonathan. And I'm Paul. And this week, we watched Strange New Worlds, episode, nope, season one, episode three, Ghosts of Illyria. Yes. All of these titles are very old Trek, or I should say original series Trek. Original series Trek, yeah. Yeah, yeah so far, yep. Uh, love, oh, sorry. I, I was going to read the blurb, and I was just going to read the first line of my notes. <laughs> 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 and the word love tipped me off. But, right. uh, do not love the is in the air. As <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the blurb? I, I did not write it down. For some reason. All right. So again, the blurb is not a blurb. It's a synopsis. The USS Enterprise. Oh, go for it. Nope. I I was going to say go for it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'll hold it up to the camera for you. This is awkward. Right. The USS Enterprise encounters a contagion that ravages the ship. One by one, the entire crew is incapacitated except for number one, Una Chin Riley. Really? Who must now confront a secret Una Chin? That's her name? Una Chin Riley is her last name. So she's married or... I don't know how that works. Right. Oh, it's hyphenated. Yeah. So her first name is not Unichin. No, no. Her first name is Una, and her last name is Chin Riley. Do you think that's how other like multi-chin aliens refer to singular <laughs> chin to aliens? Unichin. That's a Unichin. That's a Unichin over there. Be careful. For hang on, let me finish this. Who must now confront a secret she's been hiding as she races to find a cure? <laughs> Has she been hiding it? Has she? Right. Yeah. There was nothing established in the first two episodes to indicate this. So I feel like this is the third episode. And That's a good reason you feel that way. Yeah. And it's still good. Yeah. I mean, this is surprising to me and probably everybody else because by this point in all the other new Trek shouldn't say that because I haven't seen all the other new Trek. I've right. seen Picard, really. Yeah. Uh, this is, and I meant, I said this when I, and I meant it. Um, I said this when I meant it. <laughs> I'm going to say it again because I still mean it. <laughs> this is the only show like this on TV, really. Yeah. If you think about, I mean, you could make arguments that Rick and Morty is like this too, but such a different show, right? I guess it kind of depends on what you mean by like this because there's also the Orville. That's too comedy driven. It's too silly. To okay. Me. They almost get there to me. They almost scratched the Star Trek itch when there was nothing else. It was like, oh, this is like next gen, the next generation, <laughs> which is what he wanted it to be. Right. But it's too silly. It's it's a little too tongue in cheek for me. Like this is serious. They take this seriously. Right. Right. And you just won't see this kind of where they've really dug into having really interesting science fiction ideas mm-hmm. and the characters are not stereotypical. They're not archetypes where you're just like, Oh, that's that guy. And right. that, now we have this guy where it's just mm-hmm. laborious. Yeah. And 
They don't do that. Right. And they're also not doing it in a campy tongue in cheek way either. Like it is. No, and this I've, is serious business for them. Yeah. Yeah. This is the world and, and they're living in it, which is great. Like there's no, the, the winks and nods to the audience are in the script and not through the acting, which is great. You mean the actors forgot to say the stuff in the script? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's nothing that they, I mean, a sec, uh, aside from that one line in the first episode where they were talking about the prime direct directive and he's like, that'll never last or whatever, you know, like the nods to the audience are just through the dialogue, you know, like they, they don't, they don't put any more weight or emphasis on the, on these things that reference other Trek. Right. It seems like the winks and nods in the other Trek, it, like, the only thing missing is the wink and then uh, them literally turning to the camera and winking and nodding. Right. <laughs> you know, like that's the only escalation that could happen. Yeah. But with this, it's really in passing and it's peripheral and I'm sure I miss most of them and good because in the other stuff I can tell every single time because exactly. they're making such an event out of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, like in this episode, there was a part where he's talking about the ion storm and how dangerous it is to teleport through there. And I mean, that's, that's kind of an issue. I, that is faced in sci-fi anyway, you know, like there's always this problem looming, but ion storms, like that's what causes Thomas Riker. And it's what causes the original crew to go to the mirror universe. And when he says like, who knows what we would have beamed up. That's a direct reference to the original movie when there was some problem with the teleporting and they had to beam them back and they say, we, we got them back, but Whatever it was didn't live long. Thank, right. Thank it's you. also a reference to Galaxy Quest. <laughs> right. Yes. When they beam back that whatever animal and it's like inside out. Right. <laughs> and it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're but not, it's, but, right. Yeah. It's, it's in the dialogue. It was a completely natural conversation and it was just played straight. There wasn't any turn to the, the camera like, eh? <laughs> And we're like, yeah, you did it. Right. I know. And that's, the, yeah. And that's what's so great about this is they're not spoon feeding us all those references like they did in Picard, which again goes back to your confusion and frustration because it's the same writers. Right. And these are so well written. Yeah. They are. I mean, they're, they're yeah. it's so, I mean, I have my problems with this episode a little bit. We can get into that, but right. they are very, I mean, they're, they're well conceived and they're, they take us from point A to point B really well. It, it's it's really nice. It's very refreshing. It's why I don't think there's a lot of... If there is one, I do not know about it. There is one what? A kind of show that kind of hits all Oh, gotcha. Marks. Okay. okay. Yeah. We, there were a couple things that we talked about in there, so I wasn't sure which one you were talking about. Right. You should know that. Keep up. I know. Sorry. All right. Moving on. Okay. So the very thir- first thing that... The very <laughs> third thing. God damn it. So it happens all the time in Star Trek where... They have to reroute auxiliary power. <laughs> what? I just, I just love so like you know you're like the very first thing. No 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 no. The very second thing like <laughs> <laughs> just made me realize how ridiculous the very like to those things you know like there's the first thing but the very first thing we can talk about them that way. Everything is the first, but it's the very 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 first thing, and then the very <laughs> very first thing, and then the very first thing, and then the first thing, and then, and you're done. You know, that's how they talk about musical notes in England. No. It's a quaver, which is a quarter note. Right. A, I'm going to screw this up, but you get the idea. A it's semi a semi-quaver. Yeah. A, and then a, a demi semi demi quaver or demi yeah. semi quaver. And, and then, then a hemi demi semi quaver. Yep. And it just goes on from there. <laughs> what? How, how? Like, are they just throwing other consonants in front of it? Yeah. Other it, metric bullshit in front uh, of it i don't let me get me wemmy hemi demi semi quaver like what are the other <laughs> you want it that fast <laughs> that's too many emmys oh <laughs> uh, wow how much of this is staying in the podcast <laughs> comedy corner is over we promise everybody so anyway the very first thing so <laughs> I was, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So th- it happens in Star Trek where they say we're rerouting auxiliary power. Right. That happens all the time. Yeah. All the time. And we never really know what that means. It's just sort of something. I always thought it was just something for them to say. Right. Because they need to say we need more power. Yeah. And this time, I they think for the very first time, we get actually what like consequences of that on the, the rest of the ship. Because when they say we're going to reroute auxiliary power. Right. The rest of the ship like 
they they cut to just a random hallway yeah. on the Enterprise, and the lights dim, and I think the the voice uh, the PA goes down. You know, <laughs> zero fucks are given uh, once again. Well, there there but was a pause it, and a look around. Yeah. Well, more is like an interruption to their day. Right. Not not as though they're alarmed in any sense. Right. Yeah. It's like there's obviously some sort of crisis happening where the ship is in peril. And they're just kind of like, well, I got my holodeck meeting in 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> I'm going to be late for that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but it was almost like I've got my holodeck meeting in 15 minutes. I wonder if I will be late for that with this, you know? Right. Like yeah. it, They're yeah. just kind of idly walking. Right. You know, casually walking down the hall. But yeah. I liked it. We've never really seen that before. I liked that there was a consequence of them having to reroute power. We've never seen that before because they just do it and nothing happens like on next gen. It's right. Like, oh, we did that. Like, why isn't it always like that then? <laughs> right. Which I think is actually something that you've said before. But yeah, I mean, it makes, it makes sense that it would impact the hallways because, you know, auxiliary power is like just the things that are constantly running in the background. Right. You know, so drawing from that just for a moment, it's like, okay, we're going to boost it with this to get it done. And then, you know, and then we're done using the auxiliary power. Right. And this this episode has cemented my love of the chief engineer whose name I can't remember, but you know the name. You know the kind of species he is. Yes. Which is a Enar. Enar. I like when you say Enar. It's like it seems like your favorite word to say. <laughs> I actually was wondering if you repeated my same use the the second no, time in the last episode. That was yeah. All nope. you. Apparently I'm just excited <laughs> about that word. <laughs> Super excited. I love it. I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he's great. I mean, he's Dick Dick Enar, like, all through and through. And it's yeah. just because, like, he he doesn't have time for your shit. Like, he's got <laughs> stuff to do. <laughs> I will say, so he's supposed to be blind, yes. right? There's really, this is kind of like my complaints about Daredevil, the show. Right. There's really no expression of him being blind, other than that he's just a magical person who doesn't, need to see he can he can operate in the world without needing to see just like a person who can see can i would almost bet based on the fact that we were complaining about the lack of una character building that we will see an episode that builds up more how he sees the world because i mean he even commented that he's like i don't i don't have to be able to see to know that you're to know the expression you're making or something like that yeah but he walks around as though he can see, he looks at people in the eye when he's talking to them. Right. And I know that you had said that the actor who plays this character is also blind. And so he's, it's not like he can see and is forgetting that he's blind when <laughs> right, he's <right>. acting. <laughs> but I, I wish that he didn't do that. So I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of, that's my only complaint about him. That's it. Right. Like, everything else is amazing. I love that he's kind of cantankerous. Mm -hmm. and Well, yeah, like, and I wonder he, if that's him or if that's his alien race. But also... I, they, they did briefly talk about it, you know, when he was hacking away at the carrots, but he, he's got his antennae, which allow him to perceive things around him, you know, in a way like in a, in a, a sense that humans don't have, I would imagine that's how he's able to stop at the consoles and know where he is and know where people are and know how to avoid them, you know, without, without seeing. Yeah. It's just, the thing is why make him blind if he's not going, if it doesn't get you anywhere. If he's just blind, oh, and by the way, that's the only thing in, in name that that separates him right, from someone who can see. Everything right. else he seems to do perfectly. Yeah, I, and like I said, I think I think given what we've seen so far, I would imagine that it will be addressed in, in this season in a couple episodes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to it. They're, they're kind of giving us stuff piecemeal, yeah. which I like. Which I like too, yeah. This is kind of a number one episode. Not yeah. my number one episode, but like an episode about number one. Yes. Una? Yeah. I like, I know, I like how you're like clarifying that. Is that her name? Number one? Her, her name's Una? Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be some way I can remember that. I wasn't dreaming when you told me why her name is Una. <laughs> Again, I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure that's why, but I'm not positive. Okay. Okay. So there's a moment after the captain and Spock are marooned on the planet because of the ion storm. And there's this moment where she walks onto the bridge and the music is kind of swelling a little bit. And yeah. she she says, can I have your attention? I know the captain is stranded and uh, we're just going to all have to do our jobs and 
everything's going to be fine. She's kind of giving a pep talk right. as though they just died or right. are in a perilous situation. And I, we get that it's not they're on a beach sipping Mai Tais, but, you know, like they're, they, they didn't set forth in this episode that they were in humongous danger when this by by being marooned on the planet for just to, to ride out this ion storm. So mm-hmm. when she gives this speech, that sounds like, I know everybody's emotional right now. We need to continue doing our jobs. That's our decree. That's why we joined Starfleet. When bad things happen, we can... It's like that kind of speech. And I thought, the captain's just off the bridge. Something that would routinely happen. You know, it's almost like this is her first time taking command of the ship because the captain isn't there. And I would feel like at this point, this is routine, right? This this has happened before, without a doubt, Right. And they're playing it like, and, and after she's done with the speech, they swell the music even more and we get a little bit of fanfare. It's like, okay, we're going to feel okay. And it felt just out of place to me. It felt like they didn't communicate that they were, that the captain and Spock were in as much danger as they were showing us. I don't know. Right. Like, did this ha- happen for you? No. I mean, I, I kind of went into it knowing that like they needed to be off the surface before the ion storm hit. So the fact that they were down there when she came to the bridge to talk to everybody, that's kind of the the speech that I was expecting her to give. Even though they would not survive the ion storm, we have to trust that the captain and first command first commander? No, he's not. The captain and science officer? Yeah. He's the captain and science officer, officer would will find a way to survive the storm and we're going to beam them up. So, you know, in the meantime, like until we hear otherwise, we are going to assume that we are just up here waiting out the storm to beam them up and not that they did not survive. She she said basically what I was expecting them to do and why they were doing it. So I was fine with it. It just felt like a discongruity of stakes. Right. And they're getting ready to be beamed up and they can't do it. It wasn't a, sorry, Captain. It's been nice knowing you. If there's anything you'd like to <laughs> right. say to your Let's loved like songs ones. Songs of your, yeah, of your glory, yeah. yeah. Right. It's right. not that. It's just you need to find some shelter while the ions and ride out the ion storm. That's what it felt like. It felt right. very routine to me. And it that it broke from that when she gave her speech. And I just thought, what? I don't, I don't know where I'm supposed to be emotionally right. at this point. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point of the, the conversation beforehand, you know, of them being like, all right, well, find some shelter. We'll talk to you in an hour. Yeah, versus, and they don't panic when right. they hear this. Right. They're just like, all right, we'll just, we'll write it. I mean, he's very casual anyway. Yeah. And Spock is emotionless. So those are the two people, (laughs) depending on the two people (laughs) to get some sort of emotional reaction from, you're not going to get it. But yeah. Well, and again, you know, it's one of those things where like you, even, even if the crew didn't know, we knew for sure that Pike and Spock were going to survive. And Pike knew above all else that he was going to survive because, you know, every, everything that happens, he's like, this isn't how I die. Right. I, I am curious about his vision of the future. I want to know how much detail does he actually know? Right. And how does he know that it's in 10 years? Like, did he see a a panel with the date on it? Right. And does he know where he is? Right. So I, I, I feel like he has a lot of information but from what I thought was this kind of ethereal vision, kind of a la Minority Report, where they have just snippets of something that seemed to be out of order and and randomized uh, that's that's what i that like the visions he was having in the first episode mm-hmm. that's the the impression that i got but yeah maybe we'll, we'll learn more i like that they're not giving it all to us and winking at us all the time well yeah i was just gonna say so having not watched discovery i i know that it that scene where he sees his death happens in discovery but i don't know how detailed it is but also, I like that in this episode, I just realized they didn't mention it at all. Yeah, because, I mean, it wasn't really about the captain. He was kind of the B-plot in this. Right. Uh, but but they they recognized that they didn't have to hammer us over the head. You know, they, they weren't, they didn't talk about Pike not worrying about dying because he knows his, de- he, he's seen his death and it's not here. Right. And it will be so, it'll get so old if they try and reference it every single episode. So I'm glad they're not doing that. That's exactly. That's something that they do uh, exclusively in Picard. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, being the same writers, it's fantastic that they recognize that people are actually binge watching this or they've just seen the previous episode last week and we know right. that Pike is dying or that, that Pike has a an expiration date. They have adopted a little mini episode of a recap at the beginning. And for a serialized show, you don't need to do that. Right. Which is also kind of strange. 
It's kind of strange. But it was also short. It was only 45 seconds, yeah. which was nice. I mean, there's only yeah. been two episodes, but <laughs> the the second episode of Picard had a two-minute recap. <laughs> it would have been funny. Or the third episode. Had in Picard, if they started pulling from the old Next Gen episodes as a recap, in the recap. I would have loved Picard, that. Uh, that would have been cool, right? Yeah. Been like, hey, you they need have to have seen this episode to really appreciate what's happening in the episode you're about to watch. Well, also would have cemented that it's part of that right. timeline, I guess, or not timeline, but that era. Yeah. But no. They didn't they do didn't that. They didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have a nitpick. Okay. And I love that I have this nitpick because this means that all the other general stuff, all the other macro stuff, they've taken care of. And so all I have is nitpicks. Right, right. Isn't that nice? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> yes. there's this desk lamp on the doctor's desk. <laughs> And I can't think of any reason for it to be there. When Laan was trying to heat up her face or? No, like he just has his desk. It's like a kidney shaped desk that he's, there's, I don't think there's even a chair. Okay. <laughs> just so, desk. Right. I can, I can provide an answer to that. I mean, whether or not this is in canon, I don't know, but I can tell you what I have personally experienced. So in my classroom, I, I have a desk and for four years, no, no lamp because I turn the lights on when I work and I turn the lights off when I don't, when I'm out of the classroom. So I have enough light that I don't need a lamp. My wife this past year comes into my classroom, looks at my classroom and she goes, it's really nice. You need a lamp on your desk. And I go, why? And she says, because your desk needs a lamp. So I have a lamp on my desk in my classroom now. You ever turn it on? It's on all the time. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm okay with the aesthetic of a lamp. I I understand the need for that in the sense of this just sort of brightens up the room. Not literally, but it (laughs) warms up the room, right? right? Well, and literally, yeah. But not really, because you've got other, like, we just saw there's so much light in the medical bay. (laughs) Right, exactly. And so, but this is not his living space where it's nice to have a a warm element for Do you think I live in the classroom? You know that teachers don't do that, right? I just assume that you vanish into thin air after I leave the classroom. (laughs) It's a full on holodeck. Like I'm not allowed to leave. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't have a home or a soul. You right. just are there. You're there when I get there and you're there when I leave. Yeah. You know. Um but yeah, I mean that's my workspace. That's his workspace. And they just needed to put on a lamp to personalize it. I, again, like there might be an incan reason. There might be like a ridiculous you know, a non reason for it. And you're saying like what's the point of it being there? I th- I think the reason is that they felt like just a blank desk was not cool enough looking. Right. But when you have a ship that's that's tilting and swerving where people are <laughs> very commonly being thrown left and right, and I understand that maybe they, they bolt it down, but there's just no reason for it to be there. It's like a liability. Right. Right? And if he, like all of the, hol- he doesn't need it to read. Uh, everything that they have is backlit. Yeah. And he doesn't need it to look through test tubes and stuff like that. He's everything is digital. Right. You know, even when they take blood, they have a thing and it goes into a thing. It's it's kind of a set dressing right. that they didn't think through. I know it's a huge nitpick. Or it's a huge not it's a small huge nitpick. <laughs> you know I mean, I yeah, mean? that's really getting into the minutia of things. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean if you're gonna take all this detail that they've put into all the ship and how right. everything looks and how immaculate everything is. It's all very clean and giant. Right. Well, Just having this little desk lamp there just didn't make any sense to me. That's yes. what people come to this podcast for, by well, the way. Well, <laughs> right, hearing about your your specific preferences. I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't have to be there. There's just no use for it. Exactly. It pissed me yeah. off. Yep. <laughs> it pissed me off. <laughs> Actually, I have so to far. say, so in a, in a more general nitpick. So remember my comment about number one in the previous episode children of the comet yes and i said she feels underutilized yes she kind of doesn't feel like she does anything on the ship right her discovering in this episode her discovering the revelation about the infection how it's being carried on light and it was kind of a very you know very novel expression of science fiction it felt very disingenuous to me it felt like this character is sort of the main character of this episode right and otherwise she's just things are just happening to her and so they wanted to make her the focus 
the focal point of this episode. And so they gave her all of these revelations. And it was so specific of a thing about the virus and how it worked and so specialized. It should have been the doctor to discover this. There's right. no reason. I can see her saying, well, what about light? Can viruses go on light? And then he goes off and does some investigation and he kind of discovers how it works. Yes. It felt like they're just giving her stuff to do outside of the confines of her character because she was underutilized and they wanted to make her the center. Right. Because that is so specific. And the doctor needs to be the doctor. Right. He hasn't we haven't gotten a lot of doctor stuff from him. He's kind of just a nurse. Right. At this point. Right. Even later, Nurse Hatchet, like she's the one who develops the the vaccine or whatever from the light rays or however they did it. Uh huh. So he's he's kind of been I don't know, marginalized in a way. The doctor has. Yeah. Yeah. Did that hit you? Like when when she when she laid out what was happening in a medical way to the doctor? Yeah, it it did it did feel very much. I mean, kind of what you said. Like this was the episode that was supposed to highlight Una, and so they gave her more than they should have. It felt almost like they were they were not front loading, but uh whatever the word is I'm thinking for front loading because she hasn't done anything in the last two episodes. And so, you know, they were like we need to we need to catch everything up to give her the same level of character development that we've given almost everybody else. Yeah, they're kind of piling on yeah. for some reason with yeah. this episode. So, there's this moment where she's she has to go save the engineer whose name we do not know the enar yep captain enar <laughs> chief engineer enar yeah, yeah. Whatever. well his name, first name is captain oh gotcha <laughs> i don't know when she does this she reveals that she herself is illyrian and right. it just comes out of nowhere i'm like what because <laughs> it's so it's not something that was a mystery before right her origins have not been talked about at all she just kind of looked human for the first two episodes there wasn't even any mention that i can remember maybe it's kind of nestled somewhere in a conversation but no mention outwardly about her having some sort of mysterious past right and then it just comes out of nowhere it's like well i'm illyrian uh-huh. and people are like huh <laughs> right well and it's that's convenient but it's also only talked about how much the illyrians are looked down upon and Separated. In this episode. Yeah. Like the very beginning of this episode, they talk about it. Right. And this is the only, that, like, why isn't this one, like episode eight or nine, and now is the time in the third episode where you start seeding that there's some sort of mysteri- mis- mysteria, mystery <laughs> regarding her. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, it, it did seem, I mean, again, it's one of those things where they were just piling on everything. It was like, here's everything you need to know about Una in a single episode. Yeah, it felt like there were two or three episodes. Like, it did feel yeah. like they took this episode and and moved it back or forward. Oh, maybe. Not I, necessarily that they shot it this way, right. but that they said when they were shuffling the scripts around to say what comes, like, what what is the order of the episodes, that they shoved this a lot earlier than it should have been. Right. Yeah, I mean... Again, having don't without having the entire series readily available, it could be that this episode. You're right. This episode was written to be a precursor to the next episode, which was actually episode like eight or nine. And they said, "Well, why don't we establish earlier that she's Illyrian instead of the the previous episode?" And so that way, it's sitting with the audience. So when we get to this later episode where her Illyrian abilities are needed. It's not, you know, oh, well, that's convenient. It was the episode before that we found that out. Well, and yes. So I guess we're going to find that out as time goes on. But there was a point where she, (sighs) apparently Illyrians are very strong. Yes. Because she clean jerks the chief engineer from the ground onto her shoulder. Right. I was like, huh? Okay, I guess I, I, like I didn't, there just wasn't enough time for me to process everything. It was, and they they kind of gave her this swelling music once again, very heroic music as she's walking in slow motion down the hallway carrying the Enar. Right. So at this moment, especially when she starts fighting Noonien Singh, mm-hmm. Singh mm-hmm. Noon, I'm like, oh, she's like Wonder Woman. Like I got a, got a super Wonder Woman vibe from her because mm-hmm. she's tall and she's whooping ass and she's very strong and she's really smart too and she glows. <laughs> <laughs> right, and those are all the things that Wonder Woman. Those is are all and, hallmarks and does. of yeah. Wonder Woman. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's so much here. I actually, 
kind of needed them to tell me why the music was swelling. <laughs> because in other Star Trek shows, people have been carried like that all the time. You know, maybe it hasn't been a female before and I've never noticed that. But, you know, I'm like, okay, she's carrying him to sick bay, Like you would because all the power is out right now because they're trying to not have light around. And so, like, when they were swelling, I was like, why is this? Like, yes, she's being heroic, you know. And then when Nurse Chapel, you know, was like, how are you doing that? She, you know, <laughs> never mind that right now. I wasn't sure if she didn't realize it. Like, it was one of those things where they don't know that they're infected. Like, whenever they, whenever they, the uh-huh. infection expresses itself, they are somehow am, amniotic, amnesiac, amnesiacs about it. Right. Amniotic. <laughs> and so it was unclear that she was keeping it from people. Right. And I just didn't know. And I felt like that's not good. I, I, I'm fine with it either way that she knows and she's keeping it from us right. or that she doesn't know and it just kind of happens and she forgets about it. Yeah. But I didn't know which one it was. Right. And so I was just in this weird limbo narratively. And then she can just lift somebody up and we don't have any information that the Illyrians were super strong. Right. So she's just lifting this person up off the ground and then she's carrying them down the hallway. Yeah. And she's not running, by the way. She's walking. Right. Right. It, yeah. That would have been that, that would have been so much cooler if she was running. Then it would have been like, whoa, okay, so what's happening here? Yeah. And why is it an Avengers moment? Right. It's, it's like he wasn't So I don't know. you saying all this, like and the the theory that you posited just a minute ago, I will be shocked if we don't see her talking about the the strength of Illyrians or the adaptability of the Illyrians or anything like that. Because what this episode seems like is the seeds were planted before about Illyrians, and now suddenly she's showing all of these qualities. But if that had been planted before about the Illyrians, you know, being adaptable to their environments and being super strong and all that sort of thing, and then seeing this episode watching her do those things without any explanation it would be like oh my gosh she's Illyrian and it would be a much cooler reveal rather than the confusion that we had in this episode it feels like there's been some sort of masked vigilante on the ship who's been saving people and we don't know who it is throughout the whole season (laughs) yeah and it's always in the background it's like who is this person you know Mm -hmm. who keeps (laughs) saving people on the Enterprise (laughs) And finally, we find out who it is, and yeah. it's number one. And that's the scene. That's why that that slow motion walk that she does down the hallway has all this music behind it. It makes me think that the script wasn't reshuffled, that they shot all of these, and now they're reshuffling them after they've been edited and done. Yeah. Because why would they shoot it that way if they knew that nothing had preceded it to set it up as right. this heroic moment? Right. So it was just a little bizarre. Right. And her reveal feels, I don't, it just, it doesn't feel like it was earned in a way. Well, yeah, again, because uh, like Illyrians haven't really been mentioned before this and. They haven't at all. They, they were in Enterprise. Enterprise. You mean the show? Yeah. Not on the Enterprise. Correct. Well, yes, okay. on the Enterprise, but not this Enterprise. I'm There's too many Enterprises. Do we have any information from that Enterprise show? Have we watched that show yet? We have not, no. And no, no information is gleaned other than they look completely different. Like completely different. There's full on alien makeup on everything. It's not just a forehead ridge, but it's it's actual like different color skin, kind of reptilian in appearance. And so what makes me think that she was able to look this way is just the adaptability of the Aurelians. So they don't really have a base form anymore. They adapt to either their their culture or the climate, kind of what she was talking about. And so they they're almost chameleon like in that they blend in. Yeah, I liked it. It and I just wonder where they're gonna go with it. Right. It will be very weird if this is the last we hear about this. Yeah, especially with Illyrian. how the episode ended with her talking about, you know, um, I'm considered a hero, but that's because I did everything right. Like, how would it have been if I did everything wrong or how if I didn't do everything right? I would think that he'd be fine with it. That doesn't seem like a question that she would ask. I would think that they have such a good rapport. He just called her the best. He's like every single episode. That's the one thing he says about her is like, you're the best number one in the in the business. Right. <laughs> like he kind of gushes on her all the time about how great she is. Mm hmm. So I think that she would know that if she hadn't saved all those people, that he wouldn't be like, who's Una? Oh, her? (laughs) 
Yes. Yeah. But I, I mean, regardless of him, I I could see other people, you know, having having such a prejudiced view of Illyrians. You know, if she had done something wrong and then they learned that she's Illyrian, there would be more of like, did she do it intentionally? You know, I know that she didn't talk about it with about everybody. She was just talking about Pike, but I could I could see that that being her concern more like not necessarily Pike, but everybody else. Right. But it does feel a little tenuous to me. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just confused. It, it, right. it was a confusing episode when it comes to her because they were giving us things out of order. Right. And it seems. Yeah. It seems. It yeah. seems that way. I guess we'll find out as, as time goes on. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously we both enjoyed it. And I, I say it's a proper Star Trek episode. Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the dilemma is always kind of the the wild card. Right. But there were, there were two, I mean, there was her, you know, the, the kind of the ethical thing, you know, of withholding the information and uh, like how, how everybody was impacted by it. And then her reflection on the end at the end of, you know, like if she, if she had screwed up, if she hadn't been able to save everything, you know, would she, would she be viewed as, a Starfleet officer or would she be viewed as an, as an Aurelian? Yeah. It would have been more interesting had we it been communicated to us that she was Aurelian at the beginning of the episode. I think that that would have hold, held more weight, her mm-hmm. dilemma. Yeah. Well, then uh, there was the, tell. the the friendship ethical dilemma, you know, that uh, La'an had because she, she is a descendant of Augments and she has befriended an Augment and she had to, you know, deal with those conflicting emotions. Yes, you're right, though. I mean, it's part of the theme of the episode. Yeah. So it works. The one thing that was interesting was that they, about the doctor, that they, once again, did not beat us over the head with. If you think about what what would have happened in Picard. Right. Had this been the thing. So ultimately, we we find out that the doctor is harboring his sick daughter in the pattern buffer in the medical transporter. And I thought that was very interesting. And it, it immediately brought to mind relics. Oh, yeah, for sure. But why not leave her at home? Like, it, it, this is a, a weird secret to keep. Yes. Because I'm sure they have, this is not the first time this has happened. Obviously, well, I guess this is, this might be the first time it's happened because <laughs> Scotty hasn't happened yet. Right. But it seems odd to me. I mean, I understand why he would want to. Is like, oh, I'm here with her. We're exploring. We're the best ship in the fleet. We're going to, if anyone's going to find a cure, it's going to be us. But why put her in danger? Right. Well, I would I would guess that, you know, something along the lines of he wanted to wanted her to be somewhere that he could monitor her at all times, you know, and not have anybody be like, "Oh, that's weird, you know, let's finish that beam or let's just delete that file." Um <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, I I could I can see it both ways. It just seems yeah. like because they're in such danger every single episode. Right. That it would be a weird place to bring somebody who you're trying to save. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. The thought may be she's going to die in 12 weeks if we don't find a cure. So if we bring her along and like the, the ship gets destroyed, you know, she lost 12 weeks of her life first, but second off, like he would be dead as well. What I want to know is like, does he have other family? Like where's his wife? Did she, did she pass? Like, was that mentioned anywhere? Like, is she on the ship with them? Does she know that she's in the pattern buffer? I mean, it must be that she is no longer in the picture for whatever reason. Right. Because it would be weird. You'd think that, by the way, you'd think that he would read shorter books. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it might be that he's reading a, an incredibly long book to give her a reason to, like, come out and just enjoy the story. Because that's the other part of it too. Like, is this is this a twelve week long book that she's just sitting through? <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, just leave it off. <laughs> right. I would have liked some disorientation of her. Right. Some sort of recognition or acknowledgement that she's been basically in limbo, just kind of n- unconscious. Right. You know? That she kind of she she's rematerialized, and she says, "Where's the next book, Dad? It's story time again." It kind of felt like she was a holodeck right. character and not somebody who's like, whoa, like I'm in a different place now than I was a second ago. Like, how yeah. long has it been? I know that's something adult would say, but it just felt like I wanted some sort of some sort of acknowledgement right. that she had been in a pattern buffer. The time has passed for everyone else except her. Right. Right. You look a little older. 
dad. Yeah. You didn't shave today or something like that. But great episode. Yeah. Can't wait for the next one. Yeah. Bravo. Strange new worlds yet again. <laughs> it's funny. I, I kind of wrote this show off too. I was like, ah, it's just going to be another kind of winky wink thing because it's a prequel and it's going to be loaded full of just references of what's going to happen with Kirk. Right. And that's going to be it. That's what it felt like in terms of what the trailers showed. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah. And by the way, again, with the theme of everything on the Enterprise is giant. The warp core, if you think about the warp core in Next Gen, and it's kind of the size of like a classroom, right? Right. This is a big tube, but you can walk all the way around it. It's kind of a circular room, but not a big, humongous room. And then you think about the warp core in engineering, and it's just this warehouse uh-huh. of stuff, of glowing, pulsating stuff. And they're just, they're basically, engineering is like a, a scaffolding in this giant room. And it's amazing because they, they, they really sell it. I'm assuming they're not actually shooting in a giant room, but it just goes on forever in the background. And I, I think it's great. It's such a great ambience. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. All right. So should we see what we're watching next? Yes. <laughs> Memento Mori mm. Episode 4 Season 1 of Strange New Worlds Pike must find unconventional Starfleet methods to deal with a malevolent force that attacks the Enterprise Oh, every episode ever Okay <laughs> I will say, so going back for one second It was a little off-putting that there were Ion Storm monsters in this and that they I know that later they hypothesize that well, these things were always here, or these are the Illyrians of this planet, because uh-huh. they settle that not all Illyrians are the same, right? And it's just it was a little kind of magical to me, and I I didn't like that. I don't, I felt like it was not as grounded as you would normally consider Star Trek phenomena to be. Okay, and I guess I guess I have to get used to it. I'm like I'm not 100 percent against it. It just felt a little. Harry Potter-esque to me. Sorry, not Harry Potter, X-Men. That's what it felt like to me. Okay. Not Harry Potter. Okay. Like that idea that, oh, we, we changed our DNA, and now we can shoot lasers out of our eyeballs. Oh, okay, gotcha, right, right. You know, that kind of like, oh, we changed our DNA and allowed us to become lightning monsters right. that live in the clouds. Right. So, well, that's sort of stretching plausibility for me. I'm fine with it. It's a television show. I get it, but... <laughs> well, yeah, and it just goes back happy. to adapting to their environment, you know, and I think that trying to de-augment themselves one of the consequences for a few of them was to almost accelerate their adaptability and so trying to get to the light source they became beings of light themselves for example if they had come a con come a con if they had gone to comic-con <laughs> as Illyrians, if there was a a race of beings under the water and they had it was like a water planet and they had adapted themselves to be able to breathe underwater and live underwater that to me is a plausible adaptation that they could engineer themselves to right that feels like you know in terms of the re- relatability to earth sure there's probably some some if we were smart enough some way that we could adapt our dna so we could just be amphibious and amphibious right right that i get but the part where we can all of a sudden start flying as energy clouds, there's nothing in our DNA that would, <laughs> there's no legacy of DNA that we could turn on to make that happen. You know? Right. That's just where my brain goes with this. It's, just a, it's a little fantastical. Sure. That's all. Sure. Yeah. No, I get it. Anyway, that's how I feel about Memento. Right. What's the name of the episode? Of this one or the next yeah. one? No, the next one. Memento Mori. Is that a reference? Uh, yes, actually. It's a, it's a short novel that, uh, works backwards it's like memento oh cool yeah i'm on board yeah i've been paul i don't know what else else you say (laughs) there's nothing else to say no yeah we're done we're done i've been paul Uh, i've been jonathan and this has been the measure of an episode Mm -hmm. but you already knew that who's that uh laon oh i feel like her british accent goes in and out (laughs) even though i'm pretty sure she's actually british (laughs) Right, right. <laughs> maybe it's the style of her accent that goes in and out. Yeah, maybe. Like it goes back and forth between proper kind of British versus 
Cockney. I think on The Expanse, it's like a Cockney accent or like one of their weird. They have like invented accents in that show. That might be what it is. Right. Can we stop?